But we all knew 30 years ago that if the miners lost the strike, we'd end up where we are today. Unemployment, zero hours contract, working part time when you want to work full time. No future for our kids, you can't buy a home, social housing gone to the wall. Education being privatised the health service being privatised beneath our feet. So the loss of that strike is now, all the issues are now unravelling and we are where we are today with another right-wing Tory government that is even more bold and dangerous. Right then, let's get on and uh, I'll introduce Ken Capsty, uh, former Vice President to the NUN. Let you get on with it, Ken. <laughs> well, comrades, uh, I hope you can hear me at the back of the room. Because from one unrepentant, enemy within to a magnificent meeting of others I want to say how proud I am to be here with you today and how proud I was uh, to march with you uh, through Armthorpe. It was absolutely magnificent and you know I was thinking when I was on the march someone told us that we'd been defeated well, when I looked at that march, it certainly didn't represent defeat to me. It represented the kind of victory that comes when working class people struggle. And in these uncertain times, there's one certain thing that we can say today. The lady is not for returning. <laughs> so once again, we gather to celebrate another anniversary of the great miners' strike of 1984-85. The greatest class struggle that's ever taken place in this country. It was working class people who took to the streets during the Thatcher years that represented the only opposition to Margaret Thatcher and everything that she stood for during those years. It was, it was people on our picket lines, people who went to Orgreave, other people who took action during that time, particularly those who were protesting against the poll tax. And I want to pay tribute to, to the magnificent Women Against Pit Closures. They, they set up an all new social security system in our communities. Although Thatcher had taken away the social security payments, 
It was a magnificent work of the Women Against Pit Closures that got round that and made sure that they sustained our communities for a whole year. And that is something that should never be forgotten. They went uh, further than that. They left the kitchens. They found out that there was a life outside. And they got stuck in. And they grew during that 12 months and continued to grow ever since. And one woman said to me during the strike, she said, Ken, I never knew there was such a thing as life after marriage. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, I can understand why. Because they, I'll tell you, at the end of the strike, in many ways, it were the women that were saddest that we were going back to work. <laughs> we stood and we fought, not just for pits and jobs and mining communities as important as that was to us, but we were fighting a philosophy, a philosophy that was totally alien to our way of life. We were treated to monstrous bullying by the state, not just at Augury, but everywhere, in our communities, in our villages, and sometimes even in our homes. We suffered a constant barrage of media attacks and misrepresentations amounting to psychological warfare against one section of the British people. The media has got a lot to answer for, for the way that it backed up Thatcher's lies during that 12 months. But regardless, Regardless of all that, we argued for our industry and against the vicious pit closure programme designed to decimate our coal mines, our communities and the values for which we stood and for which we still stand today. Because one thing the Tories could not do, they could not destroy the values that we have, the values that were represented on today's march. Our leaders were vilified day and night by lesser people and they are still being vilified as I speak. And now we know that our only crime was that of telling the truth. And even, even as we meet, there are certain forces in this country that are really smarting as a result of it being exposed that Thatcher lied and that we told the truth. And they're trying to reverse it. We saw a despicable programme on the BBC in January, the Inside Out programme that was so biased it was unbelievable in its attacks on Arthur Scargill. There's been another one in Wales equally as bad. And now I understand that the Sun newspaper is preparing to have another go at him sometime this next week. The attack on our industry was an all-out attack on working class organisation in this country. It was a prelude to attacks on working class peoples right across the globe, not just here in Britain. And we were all encouraged, we were all encouraged to embrace this new global economic order based on unfettered free market ideological principles. And I remember a few years ago going 
to the TUC conference and listening to Gordon Brown telling the unions assembled there that we had to get into the 21st century and we had to embrace the global economy. Well, it was that very global economy that brought him down. And if he'd have had half a mind, he wouldn't have been asking us to embrace it, he would have been asking us to oppose it. Yeah, yeah. But we, must, uh, we must never underestimate the global economic significance of the miners' strike. If we had won that strike, it would not only have changed the economic circumstances that follow in respect of this country, but in respect of the entire global economy. If we won it, the NUM would have come out of it stronger than it went into it. The, trade, the entire trade union movement would have come out of it stronger. We would all have emerged stronger. And the mass of anti-trade union legislation that we have seen since could never have taken place. Thatcher's premiership would probably have been fatally damaged had we won that strike. And the whole neoliberal agenda that she was trying to foster here and abroad would probably have been flattened. So how do we know? How do we know the significance of the great miners' strike? Well, Cho Enlai, who was the former Prime Minister of China, was once asked what was the significance of the 1789 French Revolution. And he reputedly said, nearly 200 years later, it's too soon to say. <laughs> now, <coughs> the struggles surrounding the miners' strike, they continue today. The fight is not over, comrades. It's only 30 years old. And it's too soon to say. So how do we know the full significance of the strike 30 years on? Well, there are some things that we can definitely say. And as I witness the upheaval right across Europe, Greece, Cyprus, Spain, Italy, Ireland and America, mass demonstrations taking place with ordinary people suffering the worst kind of austerity, hurtling themselves at the mass ranks of police and being battened down. It reminds me of the struggle that we put up at Orgreave 30 years ago. And I ask myself, what is the link between the miners' strike of 1984-85 and the present global economic crash that we face? In 1979, Thatcher came to power, determined to carry out a neoliberal agenda, deregulating the banks deregulating the financial institutions, deregulating everything that moved and privatising everything that moved. And the following year, in 1980, she was joined by Ronald Reagan with exactly the same agenda as Margaret Thatcher had. So the miners' strike was always about much more than pit closures and the destruction of mining communities. It was about challenging the agenda of the neoliberals, free market principles. It was about fighting for a socialist agenda rather than the capitalist dog-eat-dog -dog agenda of Margaret Thatcher. Instead, 
Instead, we've had 30 years, almost a third of a century of deregulation in which we were all subjugated to the crazy economics of unbridled market forces. Before Thatcher, we had an economy built on our great manufacturing industries. 80% of our economy was based on what we manufactured and only 20% on services. Today that has been turned on its head and we have an economy that's based on 80% services and only 20% manufacturing. Look at our great industries now. Shipbuilding is defunct. The mining industry was butchered. The car industry decimated. Engineering moribund. Thatcher's policies were continued, unfortunately, by Major, by Clinton, by Blair, by Bush, by Brown, and by Obama, and now by this lot that we have in Downey Street. It's an agenda and an economic system that is based on the principles of greed is good. Greed, 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 and more greed was the mantra of the economic system that they foisted upon the global economy. But comrades, we have proven today in a very graphic way that we've got nobler values than that because we believe not in greed we find that obnoxious we believe in the brotherhood of man we take care of our old and our young we take care of the sick and the disabled we take care of those who are injured at work we have a proud record of doing that and we still do it today. That is what we believe in. In other words, comrades, we did believe in society and she didn't. <laughs> if, uh, unfortunately, if you believed in those noble things, you were referred to as the enemy within. So now we live in a world where the top 10% command 85% of the global wealth. In other words, if you turn that around, 90% of the people on this planet only own 15% of this planet's wealth. And we all know that of that 90%, most of them only own the clothes that they are stood up in. And that is what has happened over the past 30 years. And that is what we came very, very, very close to preventing. So how did it happen? How have they amassed such massive wealth into themselves? It's been achieved by a, ma a mixture of low wages, credit card debt, taxation policy, complete deregulation of markets, including banks and financial institutions, coupled with tax havens and tax avoidance and tax evasion. And on top of that, downright fraud, theft, and in some cases, grand larceny on an unimaginable scale. And they've announced in the past few days that 16 banks across the world have to face prosecution for fixing the, uh, the exchange rates. Well, let me tell you, it's the banks that will be prosecuted, but not the bankers. And they're the ones who should be prosecuted. And they're the ones who should be prosecuted. They created a massive pyramid scheme that sooner or later was bound to crash 
They made Las Vegas look like a haven of moderation. But when that fantasy pyramid came crumbling down, it cost us billions and billions of pounds, trillions of pounds, that are now on the balance sheets of banks. And it's you and me and the children in this room that are being expected to pay for that absolute disgrace. Now, it wasn't just the subprime market in America, it was the whole debt system that was propped up by credit card debt and mortgage debt and it was brought down by greed. The most recent example is the Royal Bank of Scotland and it's very interesting because the Royal Bank of Scotland has 38 billion pounds worth of what they call toxic debt on its balance sheet that can never be collected and will never be repaid. They know it's there. So what they do, they've created a good bank and a bad bank. And they've shuffled the 38 billion into the bad bank and then they have the good bank and they say, oh wow, wonderful, look at this good bank, this good bank's working fine. But the elephant in the room is the 38 billion and I'll tell you who's going to pick that up. We're going to pick up that 38 billion. That's what's going to happen and it's going to come through austerity measures, attacks on the welfare state and attacks on the, on the National Health Service. The Greek national debt, and it's worth remembering this figure if you possibly can, the Greek national debt was $385 billion. Now I was looking the other day at the Forbes list of the top richest people in the world. And when you add it up, they own $451 billion. So effectively, they could pay off the Greek national debt, have 66 billion left over, share it among themselves, and have 6.6 .6 billion each. And yet we see people, working class people in Greece, where there's 50% youth unemployment, 25% general unemployment, and those people having to fight the police in order to oppose the massive austerity measures that they now face. Now, comrades, we are faced with the greatest class robbery of all time. Capitalism is out to solve its crisis on the backs of working class people across the world. In Britain, it will be the welfare state it will be pensions, it will be wages, it will be the National Health Service. Uh, and they are all currently under massive attack. Unemployment will stalk this land. Homelessness everywhere. As those, those who wreck the world's economy, the bankers, go along and take people's houses off them because they can't afford to pay their mortgages. And yet it's those very people that have dug the banks out of the crisis they got themselves into. Across the world there are mass demonstrations taking place in Greece, in Spain, in Italy, in France, across America, across North Africa. Millions and millions of people are becoming the enemy within. And we must support all those who are fighting back against tyranny. That will only get worse. I say to working class people everywhere, it is not your fault. It is not your fault. You are not, you are not the perpetrators of this economic mess. You're just the victims of it. And now they tell me they're in the Commons wanting a Thatcher Day. 
Well, thank God that's fallen through. But I've got a better idea. On the 5th of July this year, it will be 66 years since the formation of the National Health Service. And I think we should have an hour and seven days. told us that the NHS would only last as long as we have the faith to fight for it. And we have to demonstrate that we do have the faith to fight for it. Comrades, as we charge the mass ranks of the police at Orgreave, we were fighting an evil system and an evil government and an evil woman, intending to impose on the world what the results of which we see today. We were called the enemy within. Now it is clear for all to see who the real enemy within has been. For the last 13 years, as revelation after revelation has come to light, and especially the revelations of the, of the 3rd of January, we know that, that, that Scarville told the truth, and Thatcher was a downright liar. Both against the evil system and its credo of greed. Today's young people are rebelling right across the world against the austerity measures that are being forced upon them. But there are already those who are preparing to try and hijack our 30th anniversary. And we must make sure that we are the owners, the proud owners of the miners' strike of 30 years ago. And we should make it clear for those to those who still seek, still seek to undermine us and still seek to say that we were wrong and that our leadership was wrong and that we should never have fought that battle and that Thatcher was right. We now know that that is not true, but they are trying to force upon us their austerity measures. So we have to turn this 30th anniversary and the strike into something else. We can meet here like this, and we can talk about the past. But comrades, there's battles to fight today. And we need, we need to make sure that the next time that Charlie organises a march and rally in our thought, it should be against these austerity measures, and we should turn out the One straightforward and simple message to those taking part in all sorts of struggles across the world as they take to the streets to fight for a better way of life and against the poverty that's being inflicted upon them. And the message is keep fighting, keep building. We are on your side. More power to your elbow. The victory is always in the struggle itself. Thank you very much.